This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. It is a series of programs where we talk about the issues that affect Hawaii. And today we are going to talk to a nice young <laughs> legislator, Representative Sean Quinlan. And he represents District 47, which is the North Shore of Honolulu. So welcome, Sean. Now, Quinlan. Yes. Is that Chinese? Uh, no, Quinlan is actually Irish. Irish. Um, I, I am half Chinese, um, but my father is from Australia, and um, our descendants came from Ireland. Yeah, but Quinlan is a woman hero. Oh. In China. Oh. Yes. <laughs> she was one of those that was with uh, Sun Yat-sen when women were not warriors. Oh. Wow. So that's why I asked. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so tell us about Sean. <laughs> Who is Sean? Oh, uh, that is a very difficult question. Um, Why is it difficult? <laughs> That's who you are. I'll start with the basics. I was born in Hong Kong. I moved to the U.S. when I was about a year old and grew up in New York on Long Island. Um, I went to school at George Mason University. I dropped out my senior year to move to Beijing, China. Um, Never returned to get my degree, actually, which my father reminds me of every Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, after living in China for a time, my parents decided to move to the North Shore, Oahu. And they, they called me up and said, you know, we, we want you to come and live near us. Um, at first, I was a little reluctant, but uh, they convinced my wife, and that was that. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about, for anyone that doesn't know, tell us about the North Shore of Oahu. It is simply gorgeous. Yes. And um, to lump it all into one category, the North Shore, when so many of those areas are so different. So tell us about the district. So the North Shore and Kolaloa, to me, are the most beautiful parts of Hawaii. And it's, for Oahu at least, it's sort of the last place on Oahu where you can see a glimpse of what Hawaii used to be like. You know, beautiful open spaces, ag land, farming. Um, but you're right, we do have a lot of little communities up and down the coast that are totally different from each other. Punalu'u and Haula are very different communities. They're different from Sunset Beach, which is then in turn different from Haleiwa. So each one of those little communities sort of has their own sets of issues and challenges and concerns. So what, what made you decide you wanted to be a legislator? Oh, um, How did that come about? <laughs> I've always been fascinated by politics and, and history, um, and uh, it's been a passion of mine for a long time. And a couple of years ago, I had sold my business, and I was sort of taking some time off to think about what I wanted to do for the rest of my what life. What kind of business did you have? Oh, I used to be a wholesaler, frozen oh. drinks and coffees. Um, I uh, did my own distribution here on Oahu, and then I had sub-distribution on the Big Island. So I would sell um, sort of like a slush puppy type of a product, a frozen coffee. I would sell that to convenience stores, restaurants, Blaisdell Center, um, everyone from low to high. Mm -hmm. So I had sold that business and, and was kind of wondering, you know, what I was going to do with myself. Um, and I saw this old socialist from Brooklyn on television screaming about, we have to get big money out of politics. And um, that guy's name is Bernie Sanders. And I'd never really heard anybody speak so forcefully about the corrosive influence of money in our politics. And I thought, wow, that, this is really exciting. I mean, he's, this guy's kind of lighting a fire in me. Um, so I, I did an internship with my state senator, Senator Riviere. I was a 34-year-old intern. <laughs> and um, I was so impressed with Senator Riviere and the way he conducted himself. And, I, and it taught me that you can do this job clean. And I said, well, you know, if Senator can do it clean, I can do it clean, and, and I want to serve my community. So... So this is your second term? Um, I am up for re-election. This is my first re-election. So if I win in November, I, it will be my second term. Do you have a real challenger? Um, well, I think that my district is, is very unique in terms of its demographics. Um, it is one of the more conservative districts in the state, and I am a Democrat. Um, 
So I think that, that any challenger is yeah, serious. I, yes. Sunset Beach was totally for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's, that's a different subject. Uh, so, I, just to let the audience know mm. that on Saturday, I guess it was, I saw on the news, or was it Sunday? Saturday. It was Saturday. Yes. Saturday. I saw this young uh, man, legislator, out there holding signs, demonstrating against the tourists running across the street, across the highway, tying up the traffic, trying to get killed. You know, it's like, oh, this is maddening. And so this protest. So tell us about the protest. The protest sort of sprang up organically through the Facebook group, the North Shore Community Hub, which is run by John Bilderback. And it's something that had been discussed on and off for a few years, actually. Um, usually every summer when the traffic gets really bad and people start getting really frustrated, someone com comes along and says, well, why don't we just shut that parking lot down for the day as a protest, as a signal to the city and to DOT that you know, we really do need some relief. Um, so it was tried a few times before, actually. It never really took off. Um, but this time, it was quite successful. 30 some odd people showed up, if not more. And we did shut down the parking lot for about eight hours. Now, where is the parking lot? Um, Lani Akea Beach Park. OK. So when you're coming down from Dole Plantation and you go past Haliva, it's the very first beach you hit. And so what's the charm of that spot? Now, uh, to me, all of that's wonderful. but. <clears throat> that particular spot <laughs> that causes all the well Pilikia. um a long time ago somebody decided that its nickname should be turtle beach because there, there are a lot of turtles there but there are turtles all up and down that coast and uh, you know whether or not there are specifically more turtles there i, I couldn't tell you um, i can tell you it's just about the worst beach on this island um, it's rocky there's not a lot of beach um, it's very difficult to get down onto the sand if you have any mobility issues. It's not a place where you want to take Tutu for the afternoon. Um, and you have to cross a very dangerous highway to get to it. So from the standpoint of the, the locals, it's, very, it's kind of funny almost to see all these tourists packing into what we consider to be a terrible beach that we don't go to. Well, now, the turtle tour, mm. they have created, this is a, for-profit business, the Turtle Tour. They're the ones that created this. And when reading their web page, I felt really uneasy, I guess is the thing, because they advertise sec secret, uh, secret beaches. Tur let's go see the green sea turtles. They're endangered. Why are you taking people to see an endangered species? And when I read this, uh, I thought, I, d I don't like the idea. And of course, that's just me. But apparently, the tourists are loving this, what he's, his business. So what do we, what do, we do about that? Um, you know, what, we, we need the tourist dollar, of course. But what do we do about these kinds of things, the danger with them crossing the highway? Uh, the danger of the green sea turtles. What, what do we do? Well, where do we go? I from don't. Here? I don't want to blame turtle tours specifically because even the guys that aren't marketing themselves as turtle tours are still stopping at Laniakea. So essentially, everybody's a turtle, turtle tour, tour these yeah. days because they all go to Laniakea. Um, no, I, I mean I just just that name. Yeah. When you Google that name, it's amazing what shows up. Yeah. So we've all seen, all the local residents have seen people breaking the rules when it comes to turtles. Um, touching them, drawing on their backs, feeding them lettuce even, getting way too close, surrounding them, probably making them feel uncomfortable. Um, DLNR doesn't have the budget to police all of our beaches and to be everywhere at once. You know, that's, that's the fact. Um, we're looking at creating a marine life conservation district at Laniakea Beach Park which would prohibit certain types of commercial activity and would add another layer of protection um, in case DLNR or DOE care officers do need to enforce or issue summons to people for improper behavior. Um, we're seeing a very similar type of situation um, with the dolphins at Waimea Bay yeah. and on the west side, where we're now being told 
hey, please don't go out there and bother the dolphins. They're swimming around, but they're actually turning off half their brain, and that's their sleep cycle, and you're disturbing them. Um, and we have to have the same sort of care um, for the turtles, I think. Well, now, when you create this, what did you call that? A marine life conservation district. That's a great idea. What would that mean? Um, what, I mean, where would that be? We're still working out all the details of it, but the, the idea is basically to restrict commercial activity um, and allow the marine life to live its natural life without interference from human beings. The Marine Life Conservation District at Waimea Bay and Sharks Cove has been incredibly successful. All you have to do is go snorkeling or jump in the water there to see how much the fish have rebounded. Um, but even if we create a marine life conservation district for that area, we still need to tackle the very real infrastructure problem that we're faced with, which is that folks are still going to cross the road. Perhaps there may be fewer of them, but they're still going to be crossing that road. And in the long term, we must absolutely have a bypass road. Now, this has been on the table for 20 or 30 years. Folks have known that we need a bypass road. And it's clear that because we're not necessarily a very large community in terms of sheer size and numbers of people, we're not very high on the list compared to places like in town for highway expansions. However, what's happened over the last 10 years is that the North Shore and Kolalo have really been discovered. And we're seeing levels of tourism that we never could have anticipated. And in fact, the latest numbers we have say that 50 plus percent of all visitors to Oahu visit the North Shore. So that means we are at 3 million visitors a year and counting. That also means that the North Shore of Oahu is the number two tourist destination in the state of Hawaii after Waikiki. So we need to take a break. And when we come back, I would like to talk more about the conservation district. And so stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, The Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Aloha, and we're back. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. Today, we are talking to Representative Sean Quinlan from District 47, which is the North Shore of Oahu. And we were talking about the world discovering the North Shore. Um, now, long before you were born, everybody understood that the North Shore was the home of the best Pakalolo in the world. <laughs> See, that was before you were born. And so, it sort of, and there was a dairy and all kinds of interesting things, but only local people went out there. Now, just driving down the highway is, is a chore. Yeah, just getting there is a chore. So, now you started telling us about this conservation issue. Where, what has to happen how do you create it, and what are the steps, and how can we support you? Sure. So we've already drafted the bill, actually. Um, even though we won't be back in legislative session until right. next January, we still have the House Majority Staffing Office that is available to draft bills and work on legislation. Um, so we accomplished this in bill form. Essentially, the bill would then have to be vetted by several different committees, most likely uh, Water and Land and some others. Um, and if we can get the bill passed both the House and the Senate, and then the governor agrees, um, it would be signed into law, and we will have created a marine life conservation district for that area. Um, the last one to be created in my area was done by Senator Bobby Bunda, I believe when he was the Senate president, and I think That's 2005. That's a long time ago, yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. 
Um, but he was really easy to work with. Yes, he is. He He's was. a great guy. Yeah. And um, when now, what has to happen once you uh, get community input? What? How do you, from the time that you write the bill and it is submitted, and then it goes to these committees, where does the community come? So with every committee hearing, there will be an opportunity for the committee to offer testimony. Um, and it's really, really important. Um, it's very difficult to get bills passed if you don't have testimony in favor of it. Because the chair of the committee is going to say, well, why would we pass a bill that nobody seems to want except for the area representative? If your own constituents don't want it, why are we doing it? Um, so we actually, last year, this past session, I managed to get a number of bills passed that were really sort of tightly focused on issues that were about my community. And the community responded very well in, in helping me with that testimony. What, what were those bills? Um, one was a uh, prohibition on the construction of new injection wells, um, which is a response to um, someone had wanted to build an injection well for the what purposes. Is, what is an injection oh, well? It's very similar to fracking technology, oh. essentially. But in this case, we use it for wastewater disposal. In areas where the water table is too high for a septic system, the, we were previously allowed to build these injection wells, which is you, you drill a shaft down hundreds or thousands of feet. Um, you have your pipes bringing the, the wastewater to the injection well, and then you inject that wastewater at very high pressure um, deep into the earth below us, which, as you know, is all porous volcanic yeah. rock. <laughs> so perhaps not the greatest idea. Yeah. So you managed... So we managed to make it not impossible, but far more difficult to construct new injection wells. There are actually 6,600 of them operating in our state. So it's, it is a a wastewater issue that is on par almost with our cesspool problem. And it, it is part and parcel of our cesspool problem as we try to figure out how to clean up our nearshore waters. Okay, that was one bill. And the next? Um, doubling the fine for passing the school bus when it is stopped and has the red, red lights out. Yes. Um, because that's a huge issue. We've got you know, a two-lane highway, and folks get frustrated, and they just zoom right by. Um, there were a few others. Oh, we streamlined the environmental courts by taking parking tickets out of their jurisdiction um, because uh, the environmental courts are extremely important to protect my district. A lot yes. of our issues end up in those environmental courts, and I want those guys to be as efficient as possible. And there yeah. was one more, but I'm struggling to remember. <laughs> That's fine. So, so you have, the, obviously, if you won your election, you have the support of the community. So they are on board with this conservation issue? Um, I believe everyone I've talked to so far has been very, very positive about the conservation district. But again, it can't be the only solution. We need the conservation district and the barriers and a stoplight. And then in the long term, we really, really need a bypass. Now, that's been an issue in Why and I, a bypass road. Yes. And I would think that that should be an issue in Waimanalo. Yes. Um, so both Y and I and the North Shore have a very similar challenge. Um, y and I has even more people, um, you know, sort of stuck behind that bottleneck, right. if you will. And I know that Representative Gates is currently working on a pretty interesting plan to open up a new emergency route. I think he got a three million dollar appropriation for it. Um, so you know, that's what we're looking for too, is something along those lines, um, another route to alleviate the traffic, a route that the locals can take to bypass both Laniakea and Chuns. And you mentioned a stoplight. Where would that be? So when Panos Prevedoros came out right. um, to talk to the community a few weeks ago about his ideas for fixing Laniakea, he told us that Kamehameha Highway in that area has a capacity of about 2,000 cars per hour. But with the folks crossing the road haphazardly, that brings our capacity down to about 750 cars an hour. Panos feels that based on other studies that he's looked at in other areas where they've tried this, a stoplight would give us a throughput of roughly 1,500 cars an hour, so about double what we're currently getting. Um, it's not an ideal solution, and I certainly wouldn't advocate for that to be the long-term solution, but in the short term, given how bad our summers have gotten, we do need immediate relief, and I think that would be the cheapest and most efficacious Where way. would this stop? Where would it be? I would probably put it on the Waimea and between Lonnie's and Chun's. Yeah. Because, uh, and well, wherever it is, when 
you watch the people running across the highway, that is scary. It's terrifying, and one of my good, uh, one of my good friend's daughters actually hit one of those people in her car. And let me tell you, she is traumatized. And it oh, was I, not I, her fault. The, the person ran out in front of her with no warning, but that is something that she has to carry with herself the rest, rest of her life. life. Of course she does. And uh, it seems to me that because we, as a state, depend on tourism for a huge part of our state revenues, that there would be more interest in protecting the tourist. You know, if this is your part of goal, you want to protect it. Or at so least manage them. Manage it. Yeah. Now, we talked to legislators all over the state prior to the primary. And legislators who were running for office, re-election, without exception, without exception, told us about the issue of tourism on each island and the complaints about tourism on each island. It is amazing uh, to see that this is something that needs to be, what did you say, managed? Managed, yes. Um, so we have this very strange situation where I don't know how it happened. I think it's a confluence of many factors. I think I don't want to put all the blame on HTA or Airbnb, but these are all factors. We have, I don't know if we consciously decided, but the reality is we are doing high volume, low spending tourism. And that's it. Our per person visitor spending is way down and our visitor arrivals are way up and our revenues are flat. People are no longer coming to stay in expensive hotels, eat in expensive restaurants and buy coal wood pens. They're staying in an Airbnb. They're putting 10 people in there. They're doing their grocery shopping at Target and Costco with us. They're not, staying, they're not um, eating at expensive restaurants. Right. And we're just not getting the revenue capture on a per person basis. So we've become the cheapest tropical destination for mainland America. So we've got all these impacts. They're using our beaches. They're using our roads. And we're not getting enough back from the tourists in terms of monetary value. So, wow. So you mentioned Airbnb in your neighborhood especially. What's that like? Oh, I can tell you very honestly that Airbnb is tearing at the fabric of my community. It is emptying out neighborhoods. My parents don't have any neighbors. Out of the 20 some odd houses that they live nearby, I think four of them are homeowner occupied. When I go door to door and walk especially the Oceanside neighborhoods, probably at least half the houses are empty. And you can tell when, there's an air, when a house is a, a vacation rental. It's very obvious. Um, and what Airbnb is doing to me is making a complete mockery of our county zoning statutes, the land use ordinance, and basically just you know, sticking their thumb up at us. And it's, uh, it's really a shame. I don't have a problem with folks renting a room or two in a homeowner occupied house. That's fine. And I think that was originally the idea of Airbnb, air, bed, and breakfast, breakfast. not air hotel. Yeah, yes. But when you have folks who own multiple homes in the same area and they're all short-term rentals, that person is essentially running a very large unlicensed hotel in the middle of a residential district. And I think that's not right. And so for you that depend on community support to get elected, so that just takes out a whole bunch of taxpayers who vote. Is that correct? Yes. Um, from Haliva up to Turtle Bay, I would say that my district is probably losing population just because so many of the houses are being turned into vacation rentals. And the real estate market is so hot that, you know, unless you're wealthy and retired, or you're going to vacation rent out the house, you're probably not going to be able to afford the mortgage because houses that were $650,000 three years ago are now going for 900,000. I know everything on the water is 1.5 mil, yeah. regardless of its condition. Oh yeah, not, I've seen teardowns that are 1.5 mil. Yeah. You buy the land, you tear down the house, you build a new one. Yeah, so uh, are you working with the county? Oh, you're. Is that we're, Ernie Martin? Uh, we're, let's say, um, 
Yes. Is that his, his district? Yes, that is his district. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm working with the county. Uh, I, I would say that I'm praying for the county to finally do something about this because this is their kuleana. We have attempted to address this issue at the state level, but we don't really, we don't do zoning at the state level. Right. And for us to address it at the state level, we have to take such, broad, such a broad brush to it. When the county can go in there with a scalpel and do exactly what is right for each particular council district, which is what needs to happen. Okay, now you have a new council person coming, Heidi. Yes. She is terrific. Uh, do you know Heidi? Yes, I know Heidi. I see her at all the community meetings. She's a lovely young lady. Yes, I'm, I'm really pleased to, that she got elected. Um, and so, real quick, <laughs> what can we, the community, do to support your cons conservation district? Um, I would say that when the time comes, I will put out the notice to everyone to please submit their testimony. This will probably be in January of this year. I'll post it on Facebook and the North Shore Community Hub. And when you see that little link on Facebook, just click on it and it'll take you to a place where you can just electronically submit your testimony. Very easy, simple. Okay, great. Well, this has been a real pleasure spending this time with you. And as you progress, you will come back and Absolutely. keep us surprised yes. of how we're moving. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. And we'll see you next time.